This is MindShift. Thanks, Michael. And I want to thank Michael and Trish for inviting me here. It's, it's a delight to be back in Maine. I've been a couple of times before. And I, I, I want to commend uh, Michael for having the integrity to read one of my books. <laughs> I want to uh, credit him, furthermore, for, for despite having read one of my books, to have the temerity to actually invite me to come and speak to you today. Uh, also, just want to mention that um, because this is one of the nice themes about this meeting is, that it, is the sort of interdisciplinary nature of it. Uh, I work for a university, it's a, it's a startup university, it's called Humane Society University. And, I, and it's the first university dedicated to the study of animals and animal issues. And I brought a few of these nice colored brochures. So if you're really interested in extra information about it, just come up to me and I'll give you one of these. So my talk today is going to be uh, largely about some of the mostly recent scientific revelations of what's going on up here for animals. And when I say animals, I'm using the pejorative term. We are, of course, are, don't be insulted, are animals. We're biologically animals, but I'm speaking of the non-human animals. That's my focus. And um, so some of the elements of this talk will be from the book Pleasurable Kingdom that Michael mentioned, but also the more recent book Second Nature, The Inner Lives of Animals. It's quite largely focused on that. And there may be a couple of images, actually, in my talk from the exultant art. Uh, here's my autobiographical slide. And, uh, sometimes people ask me, uh, when did you start studying animals? And, and I, I tell them that it was a long time before I decided to become a macho biologist. Uh, I actually, from my earliest memory, I used to wander around the, the backyard looking at insects and uh, just endlessly fascinated by other life forms. What is experience like for them? And that's, that's a question that as with some of the earlier questions that have been asked with the earlier speakers, not easily resolved, and perhaps we'll never resolve that. And I think there's something beautiful about the fact that we, we don't have all the answers, and we never will. That doesn't mean we, can, we need to be terminally agnostic and not pursue some answers. So a lot of what I'll talk about today is some of the answers that we've sort of had at this stage about animals and their experience of the world and their consciousness. If you've observed animals at all, you will know that they are not, not merely alive, but they have lives. They have lives that matter to them. I like to say they have lives of intrinsic value. One of the reasons they have lives is they have perceptions. They have keen senses. And this should be something to humble us a little bit, because in the sensory realms, we're really pretty run-of-the-mill. Humans are pretty ordinary when it comes to our sense of smell and our vision. Uh, our sense of hearing. I used to study bats. Bats are incredibly sophisticated in their ability to process sounds from echoes. I mean, we can echolocate a little bit, but not to the degree that bats can. So we need to be a little humble about our relative perceptions to those of animals. This is an interesting kind of corona we have on the screen. Here. That's quite, uh, maybe that kind of fits with the theme of the meeting as well. By the way, there's a cameraman back there. Is it a problem if I'm walking and standing in front of my own slides? I suppose it is because I'm doing another corona. It's okay. Anyway, so let me just talk very briefly a little bit about animal perceptions. First, I just want you to appreciate that the, the, the fact that there's a diversity in nature. Is that there's many different species out there, and they perceive their worlds in sometimes radically different ways than we do. Here are three examples from the vertebrate phylum, a big, large group uh, of animals. And uh, we have uh, up here... Uh, Rainbow lorikeets. This thing has a, uh, this thing has a uh, pointer. Oh well, I guess I won't use the pointer. I got this recently and I'm still learning how it works. There it is. Rainbow lorikeets, you can probably recognize the bird of the three, of the three groups. And uh, their sensory world, even though they're not mammals, unlike the bat here, they're, they're more, more, more closely related to the bat, but nonetheless, their sensory world is probably, we can relate to it more than to the bat, because they're more visual, they live in a more visual world, and they also eat fruit, uh, which we often do. There are some bats that eat almost exclusively fruit, but this bat is an insect eater, and has big ears to help echolocate, to orient in the dark, using echoes, and to find insects to eat. And it takes a lot of sophistication with processing echoes to locate and find and catch a 
flying organism who wants to get away. And some moths actually have evolved ears and they will actually try to jam or confuse bats with their own sounds or they'll go into spiraling flight to avoid being caught. It's a fascinating uh, evolutionary arms race, if you like. And then we have a fish here, a fish commonly dismissed as a thoughtless automaton. Uh, but recent studies of fish are revealing that they actually, too, have inner lives. I have a textbook on my shelf at home called Fish Cognition and Behavior. The very idea of fish cognition would have been deemed fantasy just a generation ago. And now we have textbooks uh, dedicated to that subject. We tend to be anthropocentric in our views of other animals. We tend to, we, we can't help it, we're, we're anthropoid apes and we tend to look at things through a uh, human lens. For a long time it was thought that chimpanzees had poor face recognition skills until someone had the bright idea to actually test them on other chimpanzee faces. <laughs> and when, when they did that, lo and behold, chimpanzees are actually very good at face recognition. By the way, they're better than us at recognizing upside down faces, and if you think about chimp biology, you can figure out why that might be. So this is a bit of an, em uh, an exercise in empathy. To, to understand animals' minds and their inner lives, it helps to put ourselves in their perspective and understand their biology, and that helps to inform our own interpretations of what life is like for a chimpanzee, or a, a guppy, or a bat. Emotions are something that have been quite broadly neglected by science, animal emotions, that is. Uh, we, we have Charles Darwin to thank for writing the first book dedicated to the study of animal emotions, and then science essentially went quiet for the next century on animal emotions. Uh, I'm an ethologist, as someone who studies animal behavior, and it's a very exciting time today to be an ethologist because um, in the last few decades, science has begun to take a very keen interest in what animals are feeling and what are they what are they thinking. So just a brief show of hands, if you live with a cat or a dog, put your hand up. Okay. Any other animals? Almost everybody. That's fantastic. That's great. Well, you probably don't need convincing that your cat or your dog or what other, whatever other animal you may have lived with it was, is or was uh, an emotional uh, being. Uh, just anecdotally, I, I currently live with two cats. And uh, Micah here, following a visit to the vet, this male cat, Micah, was so traumatized by that experience that uh, he went on a hunger strike and he went upstairs and didn't eat and didn't come downstairs for about 40 hours. And uh, alarmingly, he wasn't even the one who'd been to the vet. <laughs> It was actually his sister Megan here. So through some sort of uh, emotional osmosis, he was absolutely freaked by the fact that uh, she came home after this going, disappearing for a while. They are indoor cats, and she probably freaked a vet clinic. He had been to a vet before, so he knew what that meant. And let's face it, cats hate change. They hate going to vets. And it says something about their the, set, the emotional sensitivity they can have, that they can react so strongly to an event like that. I mean, when we go to the doctor, we know that that needle, even though it's unpleasant, we know it's meant to be in our best interest. They don't know that. They don't have that information. They don't know what, what the outcome of this is going to be. And that, that's pretty sobering to realize. Let me describe a couple of studies that illustrate a very uh, important concept and undermine a common assumption that we make about animals, and that is the idea that they only live in the moment. It's just now. Here's a couple of studies that il illustrate long-term emotional tenor, feelings that last beyond the, the moment. A study of baboons has found that mother baboons on losing an infant to, say, illness, predation, something else, shows physiological and behavioral responses to that event that parallel those of women. Now, we, I don't need to convince you that losing a child is a horrendously sad and a traumatic emotional event. Yes. Hold yes, thank you. Hold this up close to the microphone. Uh, thank you, yes, I will try to do that. Just remind me if I stop, if I stop doing it. It's a traumatic event, we, we know that. Well, is it a traumatic event for, for a female, a mother baboon? Hard to tell, and, and I'm not gonna prove it for you. Scientists don't really prove things, they amass evidence. But the evidence is pretty compelling. Uh, one of the benefits of, of a more modern science is that we have refined techniques, and one of the refinements in studying baboons is that now you can measure hormone levels in the bloodstream without actually catching the animal. 
Uh, can you imagine the confound of actually darting an animal? The animal gets grabbed and then t tested. That's very traumatic. So that's going to change hormone levels in the bloodstream to begin with. Now we can just go and get some poop, some fresh poop, and, uh, and it's, it's very convenient. It's less stressful for the animal. Well, it's almost non-stressful. You can measure the hormone levels in that. And so that's a nice refinement. And by doing that, these studies, and this, by the way, this is a, a, a Jane Goodall type study that's been going on for decades. And so they know who's, who's related to who in what way. And they found that, lo and behold, that um, glucocorticoid hormones in the bloodstream go up for about a month following the loss of an infant. So if, if Doris or Jane in the, in the bedroom community has lost an infant, uh, her hormone levels will show a rise a significant rise for about a month. That's about the same duration that the glucocorticoid hormones in, in, hormones in, a, in a human will also rise following this event. They also change their behavior. We change our behavior. We rally around. We offer moral support. We buy flowers. We send, bring over soup. We, to help someone through, a, 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 say, a serious illness or a loss like this. Uh, as far as I know, no research finds that baboons give flowers or make soup for each other. Uh, but they do change their behavior. They expand their social networks. If this mother here has lost an infant, she will spend significantly more time grooming others and receiving grooming. And it's thought to be a form of therapy. And uh, the, the term bereavement is what the scientists use to describe the emotional situation that this mother baboon is in following this loss. So it's a long-term kind of emotional response. The other example I want to give it involves starlings, a common uh, bird, very common in North America, although originally from from Europe. And studies find, I can really sum, sum up this study in four words, and the phenomenon has been shown also in rats and pigs, and uh, the, the four words are caged birds become pessimistic. And the word pessimism, or uh, and there's another study by the same group uh, that uses the word optimism, finds that birds with a rich, stimulating environment uh, are much more likely to try something new, try something with an uncertain outcome could be a, a good or a bad outcome. And this is something that's known in human, human patients. If they're depressed or they're feeling really down, they're much less likely to try something that's sort of chancy. Well, these birds show the same phenomenon and some, some other animals. Now, does this, that doesn't mean we know what they're thinking or how they're feeling, but it's, it's suggestive. It's suggestive, and I think pretty strongly suggestive, that they have lasting feelings. They have emotional tenor that can last for days, weeks, perhaps months, even possibly years, perhaps it changes them for good. In fact, I just saw a study in which the transport of, rat, of caged rats, and so these are not normal rats, you cage a rat, you, you're taking away a lot of stimulation, the brain is going to be stunted, there's a lot of things that caging does to an animal, it's not, it's not a very nice thing to do because it affects them, it's a little bit like you hear about those terrible stories of the teenage girl who's discovered in a basement and her parents have never let her out, she can't speak normally, her brain is, is permanently disfigured through lack of stimulation and development. Well, animals have that same kind of response. And um, so this the recent study found that um, when rats, cage rats, are transported from one place to another, their physiological systems take a week to two weeks to adjust back to normal, which is the baseline of the way it started. Things like blood pressure and heart rate. And some things actually never do go back to normal in that particular study. It's like a new baseline because uh, presumably it was like a life-changing event. So again, the point here is that we have to realize that why we may often like to think in our pyramid view of the world, our anthropocentric view of the world, that animals are sim simpler than us. They are uh, very sensitive and very vulnerable. What about cognition, the capacity to um, calculate things in our minds? Rats have been shown to have what's called metacognition. That is, they know what they know, and they know what they don't know. You may wonder, how do you demonstrate metacognition in a rat? Well, you give them, it's a clever little technique, you give them a three-way, uh, ch three choices, and you give them a problem, a puzzle. Let's say they're comparing, they need to identify which is the longer of two tones. The first one is, second one is, that's pretty easy. So they will quickly push the lever, which indicates the right answer, and then they get a nice reward for that. If they happen to push the wrong lever and get it wrong, they get a very tiny reward. So they're pretty... Actually, no, sorry. They get nothing. Okay, so in, instantly they're motivated to, to figure it out and get the right answer, and they quickly learn that thing. But they also have a third option. The third option is... Third option is... I'm going to get away from this thing. I'll just stay on this side. Third option is, if, is, to, is to put your nose in a cone... And, it's, and it basically indicates, go to the next question. I'm not sure. 
or that's how we might interpret that. And sure enough, they start giving them similar tones that are almost the same length. They're different, but only very slightly subtle, hard to tell. The rats are much more likely to stick their nose in the cone to essentially say, I don't know, so let's go to the next one. They get a small reward for that, so there is some pay payoff. So it's a clever little way to indicate that a, a rat is able to make this sort of contingency awareness and make a decision based on what, how confident, if you like, they are or not confident in an answer to a question. Another cognitive skill is memory. Um, episodic memory is something that's been demonstrated in meadow foals and in scrub jays. And I suspect it will be found in many, many, many other species if we, if we care to do the study. And animals don't study up on your, on your research plan, and they're not there to cooperate with you. So it's, it is challenging to study animals this way. But I'll just describe a study that demonstrates metacognition in a scrub jay. The way this was done is uh, it was done with captive birds at Cambridge University in England. This is a, a caching species. That is, it's a, it's a bird that buries food and then comes back and gets it later. Squirrels do that. And you can probably imagine that if you had a crap sense of memory, it wouldn't be very useful to you. Because if you're caching species, you need to be able to remember where you put things in there. Now, nature's nice. I like the way nature works, the synergy of nature. It's actually good that squirrels don't have perfect memory or that they, they maybe just, maybe some of them die, but some of them just forget where they buried some of those things. They tend to bury more than they need. That's a good strategy, too. And if you think about it, well, that's very nice. That works out very nicely. The tree gets a payback for giving them acorns. Uh, the squirrel forgets where they buried some, so they've nicely, are, you know, they've sown the seeds of the tree somewhere else, which is also a nice arrangement for nature to have. But anyway, so let me briefly describe this study. A little more background on scrub jays. They're a caching species. Um, a more background on the study is that they... They, they like waxworms and peanuts, are two examples of foods they like, and those are the foods used in this study. And uh, the other piece of information you need to know is that waxworms have a shorter shelf life. They deteriorate, they, they become rotten and foul-smelling and foul-tasting sooner than peanuts do. I don't eat waxworms myself. <laughs> this is something that we can study. So they gave individual birds the opportunity, say on day one at nine in the morning, to they gave them, they were hungry, they were not hungry, so they weren't just going to eat the food, they were going to bury it. And they gave them a little bowl, a dish of peanuts, and so bird one comes in and, and has an arena on the right to bury with sand to bury the nuts in. So they bury the nuts, and this is all gridded probably in film, so they can see where the nuts were and see how well the birds would remember. And then say at 10 a.m., an hour later, the bird is given a little dish of waxworms and given an, an arena opposite on the other side that's now open. This one's now closed off, so they bury waxworms on this side. And then depending on how much time elapses between that, that event, the, the, the caching, and the opportunity to come back and recover these foodstuffs, we probably know the birds are hungry, so they're motivated to, to find the food. Uh, depending on how much time has elapsed, they're more or less inclined to go for peanuts or waxworms. Remember the five-day thing. I may not have mentioned that. It's actually about five days that it takes for waxworms to go rotten. And the peanuts are still fine at that stage. So do the math. If you bring the birds back a day later, are they going to go to the peanuts or the waxworms? I'm glad you're following me. Yes, they're going to go. To the, they, they prefer waxworms over peanuts. I hope I mentioned that. Did I mention that? I didn't. I didn't give you some key information. I'm sorry. They like, if given a choice, they like waxworms better than peanuts. That's very crucial to the study design. I forgot to mention. So now, so that was really, really impressive that you figured that they'd go for the waxworms. <laughs> Um, morphic resonance going on there. Um, but anyway, so yeah, if it's like a day later, two days later, they're going to go for the wax rooms. They like them better, and they're not rotten yet. If it's six days or more, you already know where they're going to go. They ignore the wax rooms, and they go for the peanuts. Now, in science, you have to be careful for possible other explanations. It could be that they're smelling the wax rooms, the rotten ones, and they think it smell that bad. They're not having to remember anything how much time's elapsed. So in the study, they did replace the rotten ones on before letting the birds back. In. They replaced them with fresh ones and replaced the sand as well to make sure there was no foul smell or anything like that. So, and yet they still went for the peanuts. Mm -hmm. So they, they're not using smell uh, as a way to identify what's what and where and when. They're actually keeping some track. And really, animals have, have pretty good time clocks built into them. And I don't want to suggest this is necessarily just mechanistic either. There are cognitive elements of keeping track of time, and, and there's evidence that animals do that. What about just raw intelligence? I'm going to give you a little challenge now. You're going to see, well, first you'll have a blank screen, and then I'm going to 
show you a puzzle that some chimpanzees are given in, in, a, in a lab in Japan. These chimpanzees get to live outside. Now, they have a pretty stimulating life. It's pretty important because, again, if, you, if you're just captive, you're not going to have as good a brain as if you're allowed to use your brain more. Brains are like muscles. So you use them or lose them. So they give them this puzzle. And you can watch this on YouTube. And I, one of these days, I will actually start incorporating videos into my talk so you can actually see a chimpanzee do this. It's pretty stunning. Anyway, you're going to see the numbers 1 to 9 flash on the screen for about one second. And they're in a random array. OK, you ready? And then I'm going to replace them with white rectangles. And you want to just mentally try and remember where they were. Count them from 1 to 9. Your task, if you were the chimpanzee, would actually be to point to, be to, point to each rectangle on the screen in order. If you get them all right, you get a little reward. If you get it wrong, it's a buzz, and you go to the next trial. No reward. OK, here we go. Ready? I think I gave about 1.15 seconds, but you know, that's OK. Uh, pretty hard. Uh, and if you're a normal human being, you might get to three or four if you're having a good day. And uh, chimpanzees actually get it right, young ones especially, get it right pretty much 100% of the time if they have a second. If they have one-fifth of a second, they get it right about 90% of the time. So pretty astonishing spatial memory. It's an example of a raw cognitive skill that another species, in this case chimps, exceeds us. And that's, again, a bit humbling, because we, we just tend to think we're, you know, other animals have some cool things about them. You know, we build computers and nuclear bombs. We're smarter than anyone else. <laughs> what about awareness? I don't need to define this term, I don't think, because I don't need to define many of these terms. But they're in common use. And, uh, but I, I guess, uh, having said that, I'll, I'll just say I'm talking about now just sort of mentally um, tuned into certain aspects of your surroundings that require thinking to be tuned in in that way. Here's a study of elephants um, that found, and again, this is Jane Goodall type stuff where these elephants have been observed for long periods. Elephants live in matriarchal societies, so females kind of rule the show, rule, run the social group. And the older females tend to have more of the knowledge, so other elephants look to them for the wisdom that they have, the, the knowledge that they've acquired over the generations. It's passed on from generation to generation. Well, they need to eat a lot of food, and they also like certain treats like fruit, and they may migrate to a water hole or some, a fruiting tree that they know that marula tree is, is going to be fruiting about now, uh, you know, 20, 10 miles northeast. So they're moving from A to B quite often. In this study, the scientists did something a little bit strange, but a clever, simple little way to, to, to think about what might be going on in the mind of an elephant. It's already been shown that elephants communicate seismically. That is, they use very low-frequency rumbles. And, so, and these low-frequency rumbles actually propagate quite well through the ground. So they can actually send signals over the, court, over the distance of a mile or more to each other. And this finally explained why elephants have been observed to suddenly stop what they're doing, look up, and then head off very purposefully in one direction. Um, and that's presumably, that's, well, that's it can be measured. It's a seismic communication. And they have special sensors in their big foot pads that allow them to do this. Anyway, so these elephants are going from, from my side to that side in this case. So if you take fresh... Dumb. No, sorry, they used urine in this study. Uh, fresh urine from a, another elephant walking up ahead, say a quarter mile up where this laser pointer is, way over there. Uh, and then you deposit, redeposit it. Um, this is the control. When these elephants get to that, they probably know who that individual is. And in, it's, in animal society, uh, often urine is a little bit of kind of like a business card. <laughs> I've tried it. It doesn't work. I just use the conventional business card thing. But for them, it's a bit of a courtesy call. It's like, you know, this is who I am, and this is how I'm feeling today, and this is where I am. And, uh, in the case of mice, this is how many parasites I may be carrying. So, so anyway, the elephants get to this fresh urine, and they'll check it out. They, you know, they sniff it, and they probably say, oh, it's, uh, it's Dorothy. We know who that is. And she seems to be doing fine. And then they would move on. But if you take fresh urine from an elephant who's walking way back here, and then they, the scientists, the devious scientists, surreptitiously trundle it up here and deposit it in front of the elephants, when they get to this urine, this fresh urine, uh, from James, who's way back here, an adolescent male, say, they spend much more time twisting their trunk and essentially checking it out. And it does, it's because it doesn't fit reality. That is, if you're, think, if you're aware of who's who. It doesn't fit reality to... You know that mentally that James is walking back there. Why am I smelling fresh urine from James right here? It just doesn't make sense. So the fact that they have a, a clearly measurable differential response that's consistent across time and across individuals 
it shows that they keep a mental map of where others are. And it's thought that elephants do keep mental tabs on perhaps 30 or more other elephants at any given time. And if you think about elephant society and what elephants are and who they are, they're long-lived, they are very large-brained, they're highly social, it's a useful skill to have. And they also trade information a lot. So, Self-recognition, self-awareness, this is thought to be by scientists to be uh, perhaps, uh, we might say, an emergent thing, uh, a, a more sophisticated form of awareness. Elephants have been shown to have it. Cetaceans, dolphins, have been shown to have it, as have great apes. And in 2008, a research team in Germany showed that, well, at least one bird has this capacity. The, in this case, the magpie, a member of the corvid family, the crow family. Uh, you may hear or see ravens flying around here. That's one of the things I love about this area, is you hear and see a lot of ravens. And they're thought to be very highly cognitive animals. Anyway, the way you do this is you essentially put a mark on the animal, who can, and, and the, you locate the mark where he or she cannot see where the mark is, and then you give the, in this case the bird, uh, you put them in front of a mirror, and you see how they respond. And they may look behind the mirror at first, they may make a threat display, They're, I mean they've never seen a mirror before, they get the, the feel of a mirror, uh, but in the case of magpies, very shortly after they see themselves in a the mirror, they, they start to try to remove the dot, either with the bill or with the foot. And the control one was with birds who have a black dot put on, so it's camouflage. They didn't try to move the dot. So the study essentially shows that they, they are aware that what they're seeing in the mirror is them. It's themselves. So it's sort of a, a demonstration of a sense of oneself, which, again, is a, is a pretty interesting revealing aspect of their mental lives, that they can very quickly recognize that this mirror is something that's reflecting I just want to add at this point that we these are pretty rigorous tests in the sense that, that these are pretty rigorous tests in the sense that um, they like failure at that at that test failure of the mirror, mirror self recognition test need not necessarily mean that the animal doesn't have a sense of self or doesn't recognize him or herself it's a pretty tough test to pass if you like um, but passing the test quote unquote is a pretty strong indicator that the animal does have a sense of self. Let me talk a little bit about communication, which is a window onto the inner lives of animals. This is a prairie dog. Prairie dogs are cute, pudgy, mid-sized rodents of the prairies. And uh, they have the challenge in life that they have quite a lot of natural predators, from you know, um, ferrets, black-footed ferrets, to hawks, uh, eagles, coyotes, domestic dogs, and, of course, humans. And actually, the populations have been re reduced about 98% from historic times, mainly through human persecution and habitat loss. And to this day, it still goes on. So, but if you're a social animal and you've got a lot of mem a lot of enemies out there, it might behoove you to have a good communication system to identify different enemies. And different enemies pose different threats. A coyote and an eagle are a very different kind of threat. An eagle can come in out of nowhere very quickly, whereas a coyote, yeah, they're ground. And they, on the ground, if you know where they are, just keep an eye on them and you can, you'd probably be all right. So they respond differently and they have different calls. They have semantic calls for different predator diff threats. And some monkey species have been shown to have this as well, and there's other species that do this. Um, they have a, a different call, and chickens as well. They have a different call for um, an aerial predator of different sizes, and they have a different call for, say, a dog, and a different call for a coyote. And if you hear an aerial predator call from one of the colony members, you don't ask questions, you just get the heck out of there. Go down <laughs> the nearest burrow you can, quickly. Because again, it's a, it's a stealth bomber, it can come in very quickly and get you from anywhere. Whereas if you hear a coyote call, run to the nearest burrow and just stand alert and watch out. If it's the dog call, domestic dog, they're a little bit less directed and less skilled at catching prairie dogs. So the, the proper response there is look up, find where the dog is, just keep an eye on the dog. If the dog gets close, then run away, but you're probably gonna be okay. So they have different responses, and by doing playback experiments, that is to say, recording the calls and playing them back to different uh, to prairie dogs, you can see how they respond appropriately to the different calls. Interestingly, they found that by having a human go into a colony, near a colony, five days in a row, and with a loaded shotgun, and discharge the gun into the ground, benignly, uh, doing that five days in a row, um, that individual was thereafter marked as, the, as a man with gun, and so even if he walks through the colony without a gun, uh, they, they would respond very, very strongly to that individual. And uh, these, so these animals quickly um, will 
modify their calls to indicate that. So they had a special call for man with gun, and also they will modify calls for different colors being worn by people. And uh, who knows, maybe different perfumes. I, I have no idea, but, but we may ask why are they doing that? What's the significance of color? I'm not sure. But they have, the scientists, who, some of the scientists have been studying this, call it words. They, they, they call it, and then certain modifiers of words. So it's an interesting uh, sort of language skill. I did mention chickens. They too also have aerial alarm calls for, for instance, small, medium, and large aerial predators. Here's another call they have. Roosters make a call that you might call a come hither call or a food solicitation call. A rooster's uh, pecking around in the ground and they love to do that. You may see them scratch with their hind feet, with their hind feet, with their feet. And uh, <laughs> that was anthropomorphic. Me. <laughs> anyway, they're scratching around on the ground and um, sometimes they will make this call and it's, it's intended for a hen. Studies show that roosters will not make this call if there are no hens about. So it's, it's intended for hens. It's a cognitive element. They're aware that there's hens out there. Hens have certain, shall we say, resources that roosters might perceive as valuable. And uh, so they have ways of maybe earning a little credit. And one way to do that is if they find a grasshopper or a cricket, which is a nice little treat, a nice tidbit for these omnivorous birds, they will make this call, and the hen comes running, and the rooster gallantly points out where the food is and the hen may find the grasshopper and she may eat the grasshopper and it's like the rooster's bought himself a little credit that he may, he may cash in on maybe a week later. So it requires individual recognition, it requires um, patience, <laughs> and it requires um, memory, of course, to remember who's who and also keeping accounts. And they do keep accounts um, because hens are no less perceptive than roosters, and uh, sometimes roosters will make this call when there's nothing there. It's a deceptive call. Um, studies show, once again, these are meticulously studied dynamics, so show that roosters will not make this call if hens are, t are particularly near. There's a sort of a minimum distance they're willing to tolerate. And that's probably because, well, if she's near enough, she might actually know there's nothing there. It's like, this guy's pulling one on me. I'm not going to go for that. So hens will learn to recognize an inveterate cheater, and he will, <laughs> he will get no payback a week later. <laughs> so, and actually, that's an important point, and I'm going to get into animal virtue in a, in a few minutes, in a couple of minutes, uh, because uh, nature has various mechanisms for ensuring, uh, particularly in social groups, that individuals behave good, and they behave right. And indeed, most of us in our society are law-abiding citizens. I can pick out a couple of criminals. <laughs> Most of you are, pretty, I think, pretty decent folks. Um, and, and, and nature does not tolerate uh, cheating very much. The only reason that deception and lying can work at all is that most of us are honest most of the time. If everybody lied and deceived, we wouldn't trust anyone. We wouldn't take anyone to work for it. We would just ignore what they said because it, it wouldn't have any value. Uh, so deception is widespread in animal uh, behavior, but it's not common. Well, I've written a couple of books about pleasure, and I'm very proud of that, because pleasure is an incredibly neglected subject. And if you think about the role and importance of pleasure in your own lives, why have we ignored this subject so much? There's even very little attention to pleasure in humans, and yet some of the philosophical theories about life, such as utilitarianism, uh, pleasure is a big part of that. Uh, utilitarianism is sort of loosely the idea of minimizing evil or bad or pain and suffering in the world and maximizing or optimizing pleasure and goodness. I kind of like that idea. So let me just uh, give you a few examples of uh, illustrative of animals being like us, not just pain avoiders, but pleasure seekers. We don't even need to look at animals to know that nature exploits, if you like, animals' capacity for pain. Play is perhaps the easiest to recognize uh, as a, a form of uh, a pleasure of pleasure. And there's adaptive basis for play. It's good for developing physical strength and learning the rules of social behavior and that sort of thing. But as far as I know, animals do not study up on Darwinian fitness. They don't cogitate on evolutionary benefits to what they do. They play, for the most part, like we do, for the reasons that we do, because it's fun. By the way, this is a bonobo mother at the bottom here. Uh, one reviewer of my book described this as a, a young chimp being thrown into the mosh pit like that, a rock concert, uh, because, and then I realized yesterday, it was just yesterday I realized they probably thought this was two, but, but no, two chimps or bonobos in this case, because the, 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 one of the beautiful adaptations they have is that their feet have hand-like qualities, they can grasp, they get more independent digits on their feet as well, so it, you could, you mistake them, 
mistaking that for two different individuals, but it's actually one, it's the mother, and they make up games for their young all the time, and this one is the throw into the air and catch game. So play is, is, is perhaps the least controversial of the expressions of pleasure, but again, scientists don't put it in a pleasure context. If you read about play in a textbook, it's going to be all about evolutionary adaptation. Food, we may expect, is a source of pleasure. We know it is in our lives, and why not expect it for them? If you don't eat food, you will die, so it's, it's pretty important to consume it. And so we may expect that nature would endow animals with a system of rewards to encourage them to seek food and to, to take it in and to uh, continue to seek it because it keeps them alive. Once again, we can illustrate uh, an aspect of the pleasure of food without even a picture of animals. Um, uh, it, fruit is, a, is technically a seed dispersal mechanism. It's, it's a plant's way, it's one, of, one, one way that plants have evolved to get their seeds elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And why is it important to get your seeds elsewhere? Because if your seeds just drop below the parent plant, they're gonna have to compete for water, nutrients, and sunlight. And it's much better if those seeds end up further away, hence maple keys that float in cottonwoods that fly away and those irritating seeds that attach to animals' fur or your clothing, and later you pluck them off and you drop them on the ground. Thank you very much. Perfect from the plant's perspective. You can the seeds somewhere else. Well, uh, fruit is another mechanism, another way that nature and plants have evolved to get their seeds somewhere else. Now we can discuss whether plants are conscious and conscious or not, but when I say to get their seeds somewhere else, I mean, at the very least, it's adaptive for them to, for those seeds to end up germinating somewhere else. And so, how do fruit work? Well, they exploit animals' capacity for pleasure and their sensory system. Bright colors, uh, a very alluring smell, uh, you bite into it, it's sweet. Mammals, certainly, and birds, they love sugar. Sugars are just great. Studies show that, as if we need to study it, we certainly know we love it. And, um, and also, there's a big nutritional reward. Plants invest a lot of energy. A kiwi plant, to make a kiwi, is a lot of energy in there, put in there. So it means a lot to a plant to get those seeds somewhere else. And then the animal grabs the, grabs the fruit, may eat it on site, uh, or may carry it away. But if they eat the fruit, they'll often ingest seeds. And some seeds actually will not germinate unless they pass through the digestive tract of an animal. And of course, when they are deposited, they're conveniently packaged in a nice lump of fertilizer. <laughs> so it's a lovely mutualism, a very widespread mutualism in nature. Touch is the most physical of the senses, and animals enjoy touch. And like, once again, going back to your cat or dog, if you live with them and if you give them any attention at all, some of that's probably going to be petting them. And we call them pets based on the fact that we like to pet them. We like the feel of their fur. Well, they like the feel of our touch. One of my cats, the Megan, the female you saw earlier, she will meow and flop in front of me for me to give her a, a, a belly rub or a back rub. She's almost borderline obsessed with that, actually. <laughs> Fortunately for her, I enjoy it, too. It's good for me, so I can almost feel my endorphins going up. So it's a lovely give-give uh, relationship, if you like. Some monkeys will spend 20% or more of their time grooming each other. So touch is very important to them. Some animals, like goats, have built-in back scratches. They're very nice to <laughs> enjoy pleasure. And my daughter Emily and I have been at a local animal sanctuary for rescued, uh, formerly abused and neglected farmed animals like uh, Clover the sheep here. And I remember on a very cold spring day, we were digging our hands into the warm fur, warm wool on this sheep's back. The two different sheep. I have my sheep, she has hers. And I stopped to talk to Emily about something and I, and I, and I suddenly felt this scraping on my boot and I looked down and this, this hickory the sheep was scraping my boot. Her way of saying, hey, Come on, keep that going. I'm <laughs> and, you know, it, it relates to that. They, they like the feel of things. They like the touch. And they are, in this case, social animals, too. Here's a bizarre predator-prey interaction, and I lose, use those terms very loosely. I mean, technically, um, Ben and mongooses are members of carnivora, so they are predatory animals. They do not prey on warthogs, and indeed, this warthog is not being preyed upon by the Ben and mongooses. And indeed, this is another phenomenon you can watch on YouTube, um, parts of Uganda, there's this very interesting mutualism between warthogs and banded mongooses. And warthogs, on seeing this group of social carnivores, will flop down on their sides, sort of an invitation gesture, or they'll walk right into the midst of them. And the mongooses swarm over the warthog, who seems to just be in absolute bliss uh, because of the touch, the feel of it. There is that mutual benefit. It's definitely a mutualism. The mongooses are probably looking for parasites, ectoparasites, ticks and things. Uh, it's a little nutritional kick. And uh, that's good for the warthog, but I suspect the warthog is mainly enjoying it because it just feels nice. It's 
Look at all that attention. Are you going to be massaged? Are you massaged by two people? What about ten? So, you know, I'm being a little anthropomorphic there, but the point is that animals are pleasure seekers like us. Oh, yeah, wouldn't do to mention pleasure without mentioning sex. There's actually, um, if sex gets addressed at all in, say, a nature documentary or a textbook, it's usually passionless and perfunctory. It's very functional. It's simply to propagate the genes, to ensure the survival of the next generation, as if they're thinking about that. They have sex because... <laughs> <laughs> and there is a book called called Biological Exuberance, which actually is a 750-page compendium of animal sexual behavior that is manifestly not procreative. Uh, either they're penetrating the wrong part of the body, deliberately or otherwise, and, or they're doing something else, I won't get into graphic detail, that is certainly not going to be passing on the genes into the next generation. So you could say they may be a little confused, although I think most animals know which part goes where. Um, so really, why are they doing that? Well, it feels good, it's fun, and they're motivated, and they're highly charged for that. So, um, so we need to have a new way of looking at animal sex as part of their capacity for pleasure. It isn't all perfunctory and functional. I mentioned earlier I'd, I'd touch on virtue, so let me do that. Oh, no. I, I mentioned this earlier. Social living requires restraint. It requires consideration of others. Getting along. It's an important thing. If you want to be part of the group, don't diss others. Otherwise, you're going to be you know, outcast, and that's not good for you. Either in an individual experiential sense or in an evolutionary adaptive sense, either. Studies show that, and I'm glad I was not a mouse in this study, that a mouse who uh, is observing another mouse writhing in pain after being injected with a very nasty caustic substance either into the foot or the belly mm -hmm. will um, become much more sensitive to pain him or herself. So it's viewed as a form of empathy. Mm -hmm. So if this is the mouse who's writhing and this mouse is observing this, uh, this mouse from an adjoining uh, enclosure, say, uh, this mouse is much more sensitive. Provided this mouse knows this mouse. If they're foreign, they've not been caged, they're not siblings or cage mates, um, that empathic response won't be shown. Also, and I'm sorry to the men here, I'm one of you, uh, if he's a male, he won't show that response either. So it's female mice who are showing this, uh, this sort of form of social empathy much more than males. And it is a nuanced empathy. It's not just blindly, oh, there's a writhing mouse, uh, I'm freaked out, or I'm scared, or I'm more uh, prone to pain. It's if they know, so there's a cognitive element, an awareness element. I mentioned restraint. Here's a, a cluster, a mixed flock of red-headed finches and sociable weavers that a friend of mine, a photographer in the naturalist in South Africa, photographed out in the Kalahari Desert on a very hot day. She had a mug of water, she put it out, and within a couple of minutes these birds arrived. Uh, they're probably parched, and water's a very useful and valuable resource. Did they fight and squabble? No, they didn't. They generally took their turn and everyone got a drink. It's not to say that animals are never violent or that there's never conflict. Of course there is. Uh, but we do, we have tended to really focus on the conflicted side of animals' nature, when a lot of what's going on out there is restrained and good-natured and virtuous. Here's a, here's a phenomenon called allopreening. We have uh, allogrooming, where one individual uh, grooms another. You've seen some examples, and birds do it as well. And it's a way to uh, cement bonds, to make everybody feel happier. It's a social lubricant, if you like. A study done in Hungary shows that dogs have some kind of sense of fairness. The social animal, it's also an animal that's been living with and manipulating us for 15,000 years, so perhaps they might uh, be quite good at, at manipulating us, and, and uh, they, there's evidence dogs will smile, and they've learned to sort of smile, and it tends to win us over more. We're more likely to give them another treat, or what have you, and dogs have retained, some dogs have retained neotenic features, that is, they look more, maybe more baby-like, and we tend to think that's cute, and of course, that's a lot of that's uh, our own breeding decisions that dogs, which isn't a great thing for them. But here's a study looking in which two dogs who have a guardian who's actually standing behind them, they're, this bothers me, this picture, because it looks like a cigarette, a butt in a cigarette in a cigarette tray. It's not, it's treats. Um, pieces of bread or sausage or whatever they were using that day. And if two dogs side by side are offered a hand to shake a paw and there's no treats involved, they will happily offer the paw 30 times or so. Uh, dogs are sociable. They enjoy the interaction. It's stimulating for them 
enjoy social interaction with humans. It's rewarding in itself. It's intrinsically rewarding. But you start to introduce treats, and it becomes Machiavellian, especially if you have a, 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 a different treat schedule. So in this particular scenario, the dog on the right has been given a treat every time he or she shakes a paw, and the dog on the left has not been given a treat. In fact, they've been denied a treat every time they've offered a paw. And this is on, I think, about the 12th trial in this particular pairing, and they, they're scientists, they do this with lots of dogs, and they've already learned that the shake the paw thing. By the way, these, this is a Hungarian study, and these dogs are following Hungarian com commands. I find that always a bit humbling, too. Like, they, they, I don't know any Hungarian. And these guys, <laughs> these dogs have a good vocabulary. Yeah. And uh, so this dog, not getting any treats. I, here's my anthropomorphic interpretation. And, you know, a picture tells a thousand words. You can read it on this dog. It's like, this is just, I'm done with this. It's <laughs> <laughs> just totally not fair. I'm not, I'm not giving you my pawn anymore. <laughs> and by the way, if you do, if you give them both treats, they'll do it 30 times, or probably actually 50 times if you give them treats. So those controls are important, but it does show that there's certainly an awareness of an imbalance. The scientists are very careful with their words. They call it an inequity of aversion. They're averse to an imbalance. It's more than that, though, because it's, it's, it's they're averse to an imbalance that's against them. This dog's not averse to the imbalance at all. He's, he or she's happy to get another uh, paw offering. And this sort of phenomenon is being shown in other animals as well. So I hope that this sort of, I'm going to, I've got a few more things I want to say. I think I'm all right for time. Yeah, you're good. You're good. Thank you. Uh, so but just to sort of sum up up to now, the word sentience, it's too bad it's not really in common parlance, because it's a very important word. It's the capacity to feel. It's all of those things wrapped into one. It's cognition, awareness, emotion, virtue, communication. All those things are relevant to sentience. But really, sentience is arguably the the most morally important word we have. In fact, I like to call it the bedrock of ethics. The bedrock of ethics is sentience. The reason we have moral systems is that, is that other individuals have lives that matter to them. Why is that? Because they can suffer, specifically, particularly, but also they can feel pleasure as well. So life can go good and bad, and that means there are a lot of implications of that. Unfortunately, we have a very troubled relationship with animals. A very, very brief run-through of what we do. We kill 50 to 100 million a year for recreational hunting and uh, another big number for recreational fishing. We kill about 50 million for their fur. We put tens of millions into cages and deprive them of their most basic needs, such as a mother in this case, so that we can satisfy our, our scientific curiosity. Uh, we may put them in crush cages to take bile out for Chinese medicine, as in this case with this bear Jasper here who was in there for 15 years. And of course, we keep huge numbers in very, very deprived conditions in what we now call factory farms so that we can buy cheap eggs at the supermarket. And also so we can buy cheap meat. The slaughter rate of chickens in the U.S. is a staggering 300 chickens per second. So we're talking very large numbers, and it'd be nice to have that earlier picture of the chickens to remind us all, of course, that they are individuals. Every one of those 300 per second is or was an individual. We probably never did learn those calls because they were stuck in a cage for their short life. And we take babies away from their mothers so that we can buy milk and take all the milk from the mother. And uh, the reward for the mother at the end of five, typically five cycles of being artificially inseminated, having her calf taken away at birth, um, is to be sent to the slaughterhouse. This is a quick encapsulation of the lives of the approximately 65 billion animals that humans currently kill each year. That's a big number. And so, what do we do with this information? I'm going to skip through my little prejudice section, how we tend to dismiss some animals, but here's a very key thing about animal sentience. I'm not going to read this to you. You can read. Uh, just read this quote. And I think this is really telling, because what it suggests is that other species, other animals, certainly some of them, we may argue about where we draw the line and which species we're talking about, that we cannot assume that they're any less sentient than us in the important ways. I'm not talking about doing math homework, uh, but I'm talking about uh, being able to feel, in particular, pains and pleasures, getting back to those, those acute perceptions they have, and uh, the, the fact that touch is just as important to them, say, for example, and food is just as important as it is to us. Here's another quote from a very famous biologist. This was just published just a, a month ago. He's one of a growing number of scientists who are making this point. We should not assume that a chicken or a cow 
or an elephant or, or maybe even a fish uh, feels things less than we do. Now, despite the problem that we are actually killing more animals today, and we will kill more in 2011, you know what, I'm going to correct that. I was going to say that we will kill more in 2011 than ever before. I just heard a presentation recently that actually shows that the numbers may be turning a corner. In the last couple of years, we've actually killed a, a few billion less. So while those numbers are horrible, it's nonetheless encouraging in that context that we're killing fewer. So there's a sign of cultural change. And I'm really, I'm encouraged by our capacity of a species, as a species, to undergo cultural change. Colonialism is mostly a thing of the past. It was the predominant, it was a predominant phenomenon for European countries for a couple of centuries there. And now it's essentially going away. There's still the, the trappings of it and there's still the residue of, of its effects. But colonialism and the African slave trade, we've risen above that. And cultural change happens very fast. It happens in centuries or decades, which may seem like a long time, but it's nothing. It's nothing in the terms of geological or evolutionary time. The right to vote, the suffrage movement, lasted decades, and women got the right to vote. 1920 in this country, it was later in some other countries, but a very, very profound social advance that we made, a cultural change. And of course, the civil rights movement, again, the residues, the problems from that continue, but a um, hugely successful movement that made an epochal social change in a very short time, a relatively very short time. So back to animals. I mean, those, all those movements were human movements. And you know, humans can pick up pickets, and they can sit in cafes uh, demonstrating, as a demonstrator and protesting. And they can use words that we can understand. So it's a much tougher road to hoe to make the case that animals deserve different treatment. But, uh, but that's my message to you today, is that given that they're sentient, given that they have their own consciousnesses, that that are not the same, but comparable to ours, and, and I think the important ways, given that they're sentient, um, ought we not to treat them differently? They, they, they're curious. They take an interest in their world. They have keen senses. This is Whitaker, by the way. He was rescued off the back of the slaughter truck. He now lives in a California sanctuary. He's a very happy boy, although he's a bit of a bully sometimes. No pun intended. Uh, they're, they're individuals who have moments. They, they, they have, they have a, an emotional tenor. They have feelings. Uh, their lives matter, and they have preferences as well. So, you know, we can have a relationship like those cows we saw a few slides back hanging by their back legs shackled in a slaughterhouse, or we can have a relationship that's a little bit more like this. People sometimes say, what are we going to do with all those animals if we stop eating them? You know, it's like, well, wait a minute. First of all, it's the, it's the, it's the industry that's breeding them. It's like we would stop breeding them. If they, it's a supply and demand. It would cost a lot of, cost money to, to breed chickens and cows. We stop producing them. Of course, we'd have to deal with the short-term issue of this glut of animals who were suddenly liberated. But we, we can undergo cultural change, and those kinds of little, those logistical issues are not a reason to shy away from those sorts of cultural change. So, um, I have uh, some homework for you that relates to personal choice. I'm going to challenge you as an audience. My challenge to you is to um, actually have postcards here. I should bring them out. It's someone else's cookbook. It's called the 30-Day Vegan Challenge. And what it is, is essentially, here are some recipes you can stop eating animals for 30 days. It's, it's not long enough to be that daunting that you think, oh my god. Uh, but you know what? It's long enough that you may actually start to undergo some personal change physiologically and psychologically, because when you, when you change a behavior, your defenses for the former behavior melt away. You no longer have the reasons to do it, to do something that you used to do. So, um, for those who, anyone in the back who can't read the pig saying, the special sounds good, but can I substitute the pork chop for a fried chunk of your left buttock? It's just a sort of a resonance with the idea of a personal change of behavior, the fact that we make choices in what we eat, and choice is a very powerful thing. This woman, Jill Robinson, uh, who I will be actually, I'm honored to be giving a co-presentation with her in Washington, D.C. in about three weeks' time. She is the founder of the Animals Asia Foundation. She was visiting China in 1993, went downstairs in this farm and found this bear in this cage, and then subsequently learned that there are actually tens of thousands, or at that time, yeah, it's tens of thousands of bears in this situation, permanently catheterized for bile removal, for a Chinese medicine that actually has been shown scientifically to be 
either non-effective or at least no more effective than, than uh, plant-based ways of doing it. Her name again? Her name is Jill Robinson, and she's been made a, a Dane by the, she's been recognized by the Queen of England. And through her actions, uh, this is Jasper, the very same bear today. Uh, he was in that crush cage for 15 years, and now he is sort of considered the, the ambassador among the moon bears, as an Asian bear, in these bile farms. Uh, he's removed from that. They've closed a bunch of bile farms down. There's still a long way to go. Um, but he is one of over 200 bears now liberated, and uh, he's a very happy boy. And I just admire another aspect of animals, their resilience, their capacity, and humans show this too, the capacity to recover from terrible, prolonged hardship, to forgive, to forget, to rise above. Uh, we can all do that as a species, and uh, I thank you for listening to me today, and I encourage you to do that too. Thank you so much, Jeff.